Ever since I saw the uh, latest episode of Book of Boba Fett, uh, I mean Book of Mando Fett, I mean Book of Ahsoka Fett, I mean Book of Grogu Fett, I mean Book of Luke and Grogu training because Din is involved in the Mando in the book that Boba is part of too. Because... Ha! Ha! Anyways, I can't stop thinking about bamboo and trying to put it into a diorama and I realized um, there are a lot of awesome figures that would look awesome in a diorama with bamboo. So let's make some bamboo, shall we? This was my test. I just put a black wash on it. Um, you can see some of it still drying right there, if my camera will focus. Um, but it, I just threw this all together really quick. It took me about five minutes. Um, I've been thinking about this for about a day and a half now, um, about how I could do this and have it not take me 10,000 years. 10,000. And also look good. And uh, I think this turned out uh, actually better than I thought it would. It looks like a real plant which is pretty cool because I wasn't even thinking it was going to be that good. So I think if I make myself about 20 of these um, and cut them at different heights and do some in different thicknesses and figure out a way to get some leaves on them in different places, we can have ourselves a sweet looking bamboo Jedi training diorama. So uh, basically before we get into this diorama, I'm going to make the base and then I will show you the whole process for the bamboo when I get to that. But we got to have something to stick the bamboo in, right? Right, Grogu? I do not speak yet. So follow along. I'll show you the entire process for this diorama start to finish. Why I did what I did. And uh, basically I kind of freestyled it for this piece. I had a generic idea in my head. I sketched out that generic idea. And uh, I built it uh, with some loosey-goosey rules as I like to do. It's a very fluid process. I let it flow through me. Kind of like the force. First of all, I hope you guys like this song in the background here. This is a song that I wrote and composed myself and built in GarageBand and rendered out uh, that I'll be using in some videos going forward. So I hope you enjoy the music as you watch along here. But I'm just sketching out a rough idea of what I want to do uh, with some of the sort of dedicated features that I want to make sure I incorporate, like a pond and rocks and the bamboo and a couple of berms, rock formations and such, just labeling it so I have a reference for myself so I don't kind of forget what the plan was. It's always good to have some type of a plan. Whether you sketch it or not is up to you. Um, and also, I like to figure out my overall dimensions to stay within to kind of give myself a, uh, a goal to work towards. So here is that. As you just saw me do, I am using a utility knife and a straight edge to trim down hard insulation foam. And if you don't know where to get this stuff, I do have a series called Diorama and Art Supply Shopping, where I show you basically where I pick up a lot of this stuff locally. Of course, you can order some of these things online, uh, but if you want to just go to the store and get it, you can check those videos out and I'll show you where to go and what to get. Also, I am basically laying out um, kind of as you would if you drew a mural uh, onto the side of a wall after drawing a preliminary sketch. I am relaying out my sketch, but in real size here, just measuring and making sure the proportions of the features that I want in my diorama are going to look the way I want before I start cutting anything. So I always make sure that I do this uh, if it's required, if it's not something that's very linear and straightforward, but if it's organic shapes like this, I think it really helps me at least, whether I'm starting with a wood or a foam base or MDF or whatever material, it really helps me kind of keep, get the visual feel for where things are gonna be to make sure I don't waste a bunch of time making things too big or too small only to realize they were not proportioned correctly. So you see me here kind of doing my hand kung fu across my diorama, but I'm just kind of demonstrating um, from a three-dimensional perspective where I am thinking things are going to be laid out. Here I am using a hot wire foam cutting table, the Hot Wire Foam Factory from hwff.com. This is not sponsored, but uh, I've been using this thing for like seven years and I'm so used to it, I love it. I am using the cutter to cut out the pond shape uh, to do some heavy lifting for me so I don't have a bunch of raw edges from my knife. And I'm going to use that cutter to trim down the thickness of the pond shape here 
so that I don't have to do all of that dimensional trimming and sculpting the negative space of the pond out with a knife or a Dremel. Uh, this is gonna do some of the heavy lifting for me as you'll see here. After I got some rough shapes carved out of that pond um, thickness and I re-glued everything back into place uh, as far as my rough end goes for the shape of the pond and the pool, I went ahead and took this piece off of the front right of the diorama, which I intended to always have a large rock on, and I used it to shape a piece of dry foam or floral foam um, that I intend to carve the rock out of here. So I used that basically as a template uh, to get the shape correct on the base that I could then carve off of and not worry about having to carve the base shape after I carve the actual detail here, and which I'm doing. You can see me using the exact same knife I used on the XPS foam. And this is just a matter of uh, personal taste. Shave it down to where you like it, uh, depending on the rock strata or the rock style that you want to emulate. And uh, yeah, go nuts. There's nothing to it other than what you see me doing right here.
You don't have to do this step I'm doing right here if you don't want to. I just like to do it because it helps keep the rock in place while the glue is drying. I just stab some uh, broken off um, sticks there into the base so that I can stab them up into the foam and then I spread some foam, uh, foam friendly glue down. If you didn't have those sticks in there, you might accidentally slide your foam around. Uh, but because I like to not have to wait for glue to dry or paint to dry for that matter, and I like to keep working and work fast, I do little things like that just to help myself along the way. So like I said, you don't have to do that if you don't want to. It was just a little thing I did to help me keep moving, uh, shall we say. Probably the most important step in working with floral foam in a diorama like this is you want to coat it in something that will give it a hard shell so that you don't just ruin your nice sculpt on that nice soft dry foam. So I found that Mod Podge is pretty much the simplest thing um, and it actually does an excellent job. Keep in mind though, if you do more than two layers, you might start to lose textural and fine detail. So I recommend at least two layers, very thin, maybe even watered down. Um, and I would experiment with it before you do it on your piece so that you're comfortable with how to do it. What you see me doing here is essentially the Leonardo da Vinci sculpting method. Uh, he's quoted as saying, I don't know if he really said it, but he's quoted as saying, um, when he carved the statue of David, he basically just took a block of stone and took away everything that didn't look like David. So I'm taking that concept here and I'm taking my blocks of two inch foam and I'm taking away everything that doesn't look like what I want it to look like. And so I'm using the hot wire cutter as the tool to shave down the foam to get the mound shapes I want. There's nothing else to it other than to just do it. So give it a shot. It's a lot of fun.
the next little thing I did was just a little bit of hand carving with my blade here just to create a little bit more interest on the piece. This is just a matter of personal opinion and personal preference. And uh, yeah, I'm just kind of doing it until I like it or don't like it and adjusting it and, you know, just kind of feeling it out. You can see what the foam looks like after two layers of Mod Podge have dried nice and hard and uh, what it looks like uh, when it's not Mod Podge versus when it is Mod Podge. I added a few additional rocks there at the bottom as well. And uh, I was testing some placement for how to get my bamboo into the foam using a wood burning tool to basically heat drill holes. And uh, it worked out pretty good. So I did this a little bit different towards the end of the diorama, but you'll see what I do soon. What you see me doing here is fairly self-explanatory. I'm just getting in there with a Dremel or any type of rotary tool that you might have, you can do the same thing with, and a sanding drum. And I am smoothing out the transitions between those hard hot wire cuts I made earlier, just so it looks like uh, more natural, the transition occurring on the bottom of the pond to the uh, beaches or the um, next uh, surface layer above the water. And I'm just kind of grinding that to my leisure at my leisure, um, deciding what I think is going to look best and uh, just kind of being creative, you know, and feeling it out, even kind of carving up into my uh, little hills there as you see me doing. So something that occurs when you use heat tools, especially rotary heat tools on this hard high density foam is as well as grinding it and sanding it down, if you hold the rotary sander in certain spots for more than a few seconds, it will kind of heat up the foam and melt it a little bit as well. And you end up with these sort of plastic burrs, uh, kind of like you would if you were cutting a piece of metal, you might end up with little pokey sharp pieces. You get the exact same thing here uh, just with foam and heat on the foam. So I'm just going over it with 120 grit and 80 grit sandpapers, just kind of smoothing out those sharp edges so that I don't actually cut myself on the foam now. So just something to be aware of. You will notice that after you do this process, if you do this process.
So what you see me doing here is basically creating a paper mache uh, overlay on my diorama. I'm using toilet paper and a mixture of water and Mod Podge. And the water and Mod Podge that I'm using right now is definitely more water than Mod Podge. That's on purpose so that I can dissolve the toilet paper more when the water starts to touch it and control it more with the wet brush. You don't have to do it that way. You can achieve all kinds of different effects with different amounts of Mod Podge and water and different densities of toilet paper even. You can even use paper towels, but keep in mind, paper towels may leave the texture that is on the paper visible when it dries because uh, paper towels are not designed to dissolve in water like toilet paper is. So I highly recommend toilet paper, or you can even do this with newspaper if you want, if you're planning on covering it with some other substrate, like I will do with this, like dirt or sand or rocks or whatever you want to do. But I like this method for creating uh, a very subtle texture uh, in addition to the ones I already created. So this is really just about achieving the effect that you saw in the thumbnail. So as you'll see, I just slowly layer this up and strategically place it in ways that I think looks artistically good or looks natural. And you really gotta kind of trust your vision on this and just go for it, uh, lay it out how you want and um, practice makes perfect. So try this on something uh, that you're not uh, trying to make perfect the first time. If you've never done this before, just maybe try it on a scrap piece of foam, experiment with it, let it dry overnight, paint it, see how it turned out. I've done this quite a bit now, so I'm pretty comfortable just diving in, but uh, it's a fun process and I think it looks great when it's done. And like I said, there's different ways of employing it. You can use uh, more Mod Podge, less Mod Podge, more water, less water, thicker toilet paper, and you'll get all kinds of slightly different results for different effects. So have fun. There's a few different things going on here uh, that you're seeing. I am making sure that I anchor down my little hill pieces uh, before I start the transition fully up from the pond and flat layer up onto these berms so that they are firmly in place in their dedicated spots uh, before I start to paper mache it. I also lay down a little bit of sand into the pond just to add some texture under the water that's eventually going to be there. Um, and in a minute, you'll see me start laying down rocks. I got some smooth rocks to kind of emulate river rock because river rock in most rivers uh, tends to tumble down and get smoothed out depending on the type of rock and river that it's in. And I laid down some um, sort of coarser, denser rock that was halfway between sort of the sand grains and the river rocks. And I just took my time to do that as strategically and natural looking as possible. That just takes a... Uh, Takes your, takes your human eye and remembering what your creek looked like when you were a kid, you know, playing in the creek. I was kind of channeling my memories of a child playing in the water as I did this to just give it that, just that perfect feel. So have fun. And uh, I smeared those rocks with all kinds of Mod Podge as well so that they would glue down to the Mod Podge layer underneath. So 
So the next step here is I'm basically laying down or stippling down a thin layer of actual just Mod Podge by itself and I'm just going a section at a time as I see fit and sprinkling actual dirt from outside on the ground that I have gathered up and sifted into different thicknesses of dirt basically and different densities of dirt and sprinkling it uh, as I see fit. And as you see, I'm not doing perfectly even layers of it as well because I do have that texture I created underneath. And so having some variation in overlap and underlap of the de various textures that I've created throughout this diorama uh, is actually quite good because when you paint it, it just makes it look all that more natural instead of having a perfectly consistent texture all the way around it because most natural environments don't have that they have a variation in texture and so i'm just using that real dirt uh, to sprinkle it on and if you live in a wet or humid environment and you want to go get real dirt from outside you may have to let it dry uh, stick it in front of a fan stick it in your oven something like that and let it dry out uh, thankfully i live in a high desert environment so the dirt is pretty much always dry all the time but you can see that it looks pretty darn good just like that i haven't painted anything and of course you see the white sticking out from underneath under that sort of paper mache layer we did, but you can already get the feel for how once this is painted and if we're careful about how we paint it, it can turn out pretty great. So let's paint. So after base coating those rocks in a nice dense black undercoat layer, because those are going to be sort of a granite color, and I find that black is a pretty good base for granite colored rocks or granite looking rocks, I'm making a wash or really, I guess, more of a thin, very thin paint, not so much a wash with that nutmeg and water, kind of a 50-50 mixture. And I went ahead and just used the same brush I did that black paint with because it'll add a little bit of variation and darkness to some of the uh, dabbing and brushing that I lay down. And you'll see that thinning out this a lot will help that paint to flow nicely into all the little coarseness of textures that we created using the sand and the toilet paper and the rocks and the dirt. Whereas if we use just a thick solid paint, it actually might cover over some of that texture and lay too thick of a layer of paint and it would actually end up hiding a lot of the texture. So just be mindful that using watered down paint, not necessarily a wash, but really watered down paint uh, is a great way to fill in all of your texture without hiding your texture. And uh, yeah, you might have to let it dry a lot longer though, just so just keep that in mind. So as you can see, it has dried overnight and I'm coming back in here with a lighter color that I thought complemented the nutmeg really well. Um, it's sort of a golden brown looking color. Um, I didn't want to dry brush over this because I actually thought it looked quite nice as it dried. Um, I didn't want to risk ruining it by just dry brushing over the whole thing. So I'm strategically stippling and sort of dry brushing with just a little bit of paint on my brush where I think highlights might actually sort of serve the purpose of, of, of drawing out the details of the piece and making it look interesting. You can do this at your leisure. You don't have to do it if you don't want to. You can do more of it, less of it. You can use a darker color. This is just what I thought might look nice on my piece. So have fun.
I'm also adding in some low lights, uh, just using black wash, a very, very thin black wash, by the way, too. It's uh, all water and just a little bit of black paint. And I'm just dabbing it and letting it run um, into some of the areas that I think would be the lowest lying areas, just as I feel. Again, you don't have to do this process either, but it's just something that I thought would look a little bit more interesting and create some lighting in the piece, even when it doesn't have any. I'm just using a darker gray here or sort of the dark color tone to go over my base layer as the first uh, color tone layer here and I'm dry brushing that on. If you're not familiar with what dry brushing it is, it's just basically loading up the tip of a, a usually a stiff brush um, like this with uh, just a little bit of paint, just enough to where you drag the brush across something and it doesn't coat it in an, a full swipe of paint. It just kind of lets the paint fall off onto the highest area or the areas where there's texture and it kind of pulls the paint off your brush for you, which uh, ends up actually creating a nice shadow effect and variation over whatever texture you're dry brushing. So I'm just doing this uh, to whatever extent I feel is necessary at the moment. And I even dab a little bit off too in some areas strategically where I thought maybe a little bit too much got on. And uh, yeah, you just do this once with a dark layer and then once with a light layer and then a wash at the end and it looks great. You'll see what I mean here in just a minute. So you can see here with just, just that dark gray layer after it's started to dry and cure, 
you really, really make the rock start to come alive. So you don't have to use the specific color I did. Any grays will do this uh, effect, and I would encourage you to experiment with even browns or greens uh, on your rocks. So moving on to the second layer here, I'm using that granite gray, or basically just a lighter gray color, um, to dry brush just like I did that first layer over this layer and you do want to wait until that first layer is at least dry It doesn't have to be hundred percent cured but dried so you're not moving around dark gray paint Because then you're going to create weird sort of mushy gray tones that blend all over the place and don't look right So you might also think now the rock looks a little bit too bright But keep in mind we're going to add a wash at the end that will tone everything down and blend it in with the soil Now that the grays are down and I'm happy with them and they are dry, I created a wash using dirty paint water. I love using dirty paint water because it's got all kinds of tones and stuff in it. And then I mix that with some of that nutmeg color that we used on the soil. And I'm basically going to use this very thin, and I stress very thin wash, uh, using my soil color mixed with the dirty paint water. And I'm going to soak up my brush and I'm going to dab and swipe and let the wash kind of run all over the rock like you see here, and just keep adding it and subtracting it with a dabbing uh, piece of toilet paper there, um, or paper towel, I can't remember what I was using, but dabbing it down and dabbing it up until I'm happy with the results. And it's just a matter of kind of getting in there and letting it run wild. And if it's too thick, pulling it off or thinning out the wash, or if it's too thin, adding more paint. Uh, just kind of something you have to do multiple times until you get the feel for the paints and the brushes that you use and the environment you do it in. Uh, but as you can see, it immediately starts to tie in the rock with the soil around it as if soil from the dirt had been tread up onto the rock or blown up onto the rock over time with the wind and different atmospheric things at play or the rain. And uh, it really brings down the tonality and brightness of that rock back down to a little bit more realistic of a tone and ties it right in with the rest of the diorama.
was very, very happy with the results when it all dried, so it was time to move on to the bamboo. And I did some of this already at this point, but we're about to go over it in detail with you and exactly how I did all of this. And I hope you guys take a lot of the concepts here I'm about to show you and I have shown you so far, and you make them your own. You don't necessarily uh, copy every little thing that I've done here exactly as I've done it, but you take these things and you employ them in your own way or create your own ideas using them or evolve them into something new. That's what my hope would be here for you watching this video. And if you do any of those things or use any of these techniques, please tag me in your social media posts on Facebook or Instagram or YouTube. I'd love to see what you do with these. This little doohickey here is a three inch grinder, a little grinder that I got from Harbor Freight Tools years ago. And I love this thing. It's been super fast. It's sort of like a sideways large Dremel almost. And uh, it's great. Uh, it's not a giant bench grinder, but it's extremely useful. This little guy here is a hobby miter box, and you don't have to use either of these tools for this process. I just happen to have them, so I'm going to use them uh, to achieve the effects I want to achieve. And you need some dowels of various sizes. I did not go bigger than a 5 16 inch diameter uh, dowel for this. You can go bigger if you want to do bigger pieces for bigger figures or whatever you're planning on doing. Um, but I felt like that was about the right size or the biggest size I wanted to go. I am marking the dowels about every two inches here because that's where I'm going to put those little notches and grooves that bamboo stalks have in them, those little sort of growth divisions in bamboo. I don't know what they're specifically called, um, but I used my miter box for that. I twisted the rod in the miter box and just let my saw kind of go back and forth and cut a very, very tiny groove in that dowel as you see there to create that sort of um, growth section or little piece that you would see in bamboo on these stalks. So I basically turned my little bench grinder up to 10 billion here on the RPMs and I basically kind of use it like a reverse lathe here where I'm cutting out uh, the material from the bamboo stalk in between the grooves I just cut on my miter saw and just doing it to my liking so that it has some undulation and some sort of width and some uh, different diameters to it to make it look like it has some natural shape and growth to it and I just did this until, until I thought it looked good or looked like bamboo. You can do this more or less if you want. You can try to do it smoother or rougher if you want. Uh, I would encourage you to experiment. And again, you could do this just with a Dremel tool. You could just maybe clamp your dowel down or hold it down on the table and just Dremel this out. I just chose to use this uh, tool that I have because I've gotten used to it over the years. So we're going to do the painting here, and I did a green color as the underlayer. Uh, you don't have to use this exact green color, of course. You can use any green that you like for your bamboo or your plants. And then I dusted it with a little bit of this yellow color because 
Sometimes we think, oh, I need to make a plant, so I just need to paint it green or a couple of colors of green, but yellow can actually complement green very, very nicely. So if you think about going out into a grassy field, there's gonna be yellow grass, drying grass, dead grass, dandelions. And so to the mind, it's very uh, pleasing and natural to see yellows mixed in with greens. It almost makes the greens look more realistic. Again, another step you don't have to do if you don't want to, but I thought it was necessary here, where in these grooves, I wanted to fill them in uh, with a another brighter green or a brighter yellow color to highlight the fact that those details were there. Because on a full-size piece of bamboo, you're gonna be able to notice those. And so this is a way to kind of draw the eye in to notice the detail that was carved into it. I'm taking a bright yellow acrylic and I am just basically mushing it into all those grooves all the way around on all these bamboo skewers. And once I mush that yellow in, and I do it on all the grooves, I take a paper towel and I dampen it with some of my dirty paint water, and I basically rub that paint back off of the piece, just like so. I did this with yellow on all of the bamboo skewers, and I did this to different, um, different densities and thicknesses of yellow. I did some more yellow on other pieces, less yellow on other pieces, just to create some natural looking variation between the stalks of bamboo. After I did all the yellow, I went back with that sort of bright limey green color there, and I did the same thing with the lime green. Doing this twice um, with two different bright colors, I felt like it really added some nice tonality and naturalness to these. And again, you can do this with more greens or more yellows or less yellows or less greens, darker greens, lighter greens. These are just the ones that I had on hand that I thought looked right for the effect that I was trying to achieve. All right, this next step is a tricky one. And so I actually use my drill for this because I'm very, very comfortable with it. But what you see in my hands now is a floral garland uh, from the craft store. Now you can get these in a billion different types of greenery. They're excellent to use for accenting your dioramas. I don't necessarily recommend filling a diorama with this stuff because it does look plastic when you get up close to it. But if you use it strategically, it looks really nice. What you see me doing here is dangerous if you're not used to using a drill. So you might want to grab one of those little pinhole drills or have an adult help you if you are underage. Please be careful, kids. Don't hurt yourself here. Um, but I am starting a pilot hole with my drill and then I'm angling it down into the piece. And in some cases, I just drilled all the way through the rod. It didn't really matter because the way I layered this all in, it kind of hid the holes and I can also do paint touch up. But I took that garland and I picked that garland specifically because I thought the leaf clusters looked pleasing and would look nice amongst these sort of bamboo pieces. It's not exactly how bamboo leaves look, but I thought it looked nice for what I was trying to achieve, the sort of space china look that I'm trying to achieve. And this is just a uh, very tedious uh, game of cutting off the pieces off the garland that you like, drilling pilot holes and uh, drilling them at an angle uh, that looks like they're naturally growing out of the bamboo. And I put about two or three or four or even five of these on each stalk, depending on the thickness and size of the stalk, and glued them in using Mod Podge. And you get a bunch of these. And they look really, really cool. I'm pretty happy with them. I think next time I do them, I might try some other methods, but this way looked pretty pleasing. And some of those holes that I used my wood burning tool to melt into the foam, I was able to poke these through my toilet paper and uh, kind of place them in and make sure they were looking like I wanted to. And I was able to start laying these out and just kind of uh, just kind of having fun laying them out and figuring out which ones should go in which hole and which ones look best where. So now it's just kind of like being a little floral arranger, being a florist on your own diorama. So as this was kind of fun and relaxing to do when I got to this point.
for the areas that I did not uh, pre-cut holes with the wood burning tool because the wood burning tool uh, I only could do a few different size holes with and some of these skewers were smaller than the holes I could do with the wood burning tool so I busted out my nice drill bits and um, I just drilled right into the diorama and I also tried to strategically drill at angles that I thought these things would look nice at. So I really just, you know, very tediously and slowly and cautiously went about planning each piece, where it should go, where it should overlap, and which way it should angle as well, uh, until I thought it looked really, really nice. So I just went through the whole piece and did this, and I think I ended up making about 25 or so bamboo skewers that got placed into this diorama over time. And uh, yeah, just took my time placing them until I thought they looked nice and pleasing to the eye. I did not glue them, by the way, at this point. I placed them all, and then once I got all of them in where I thought they all looked good, I went back and glued them at that point. Let's talk about grass or tall grass here, or snake grass. Basically for this grass, I used a couple of different things. I used some other uh, pre-made miniature plant pieces that I snipped off and stuck in there. Um, and I also used this. This is basically an imitation pine needle plant that I got in the floral section. And I trimmed off random lengths of pine needles and I bundled them up into little, little bunches and I took a nail and I just poked holes uh, around the base of my bamboo and other parts of my diorama and I took those little pieces of pine needle or imitation pine needle I stuck the base of those imitation pine needles in Mod Podge and then I stuck them in my nail holes and uh, I just did this until I thought it looked nice and I did it strategically I even took my scissors afterwards and kind of gave some of these a haircut and I did the same thing with some um, pre-made yellow uh, sort of hay fibers that are designed for modelers and diorama makers. I don't use a lot of stuff that's made for diorama makers. I try to make everything myself uh, or emulate everything myself when I can. But those little yellow uh, hairs and the way they behave are excellent um, for uh, exactly the effect I was trying to achieve is like sort of undergrowth and and uh, foliage and things growing in and around the bamboo stalks. And so I just basically did this uh, until I thought it looked good all around the diorama. So I'm really working my way down into the smaller types of foliage here. Now I'm at a turf layer where I'm basically laying down Mod Podge so I can sprinkle on some homemade turf or imitation fake grass that I made myself. And as you'll see in a moment, it is the grass I made in this video, how to make miniature grass or turf. Um, if you'd like to see how exactly I made this using a sawdust and paint method, go check out that video. But this is the exact jar of stuff I made in that video and we are using it here. I thought it was the perfect color to use to create this sort of like rich healthy grass or uh, ground cover underlayment next to all this other stuff that we just made and uh, that's basically all there is to it. This is a behind the scenes look at the destruction that is wrought when I make one of these videos over the course of a couple of days. A little bit of Bob Ross action for the inspiration on this diorama making our uh, our own little world here but we're going to move on to the water effects and using this tabletop resin that i got at home depot it is basically the exact same thing chemically as most of the clear art resins but it is about 33 percent cheaper and does the same thing and i think it kind of does it a little bit better actually it works excellent for doing a shallow pond or a shallow lake or some type of shallow water feature in a diorama I poured this about 3 eighths of an inch thick and it behaved just perfectly fine. I think any thicker than about a half an inch uh, it would be unwise. You probably want to do it in a couple of pours. But uh, this stuff uh, works absolutely great. And if you have a barrier of paint and Mod Podge in between your foam and your resin, this resin shouldn't melt the foam. 
If you're not familiar with resins, they have an exothermic reaction, typically meaning as they combine chemically in their mix, they generate heat. And if you were to pour them directly onto something like foam, it would just melt the foam. But having a couple of layers of paint, some rocks in there, and a layer of thick Mod Podge paper mache basically prevents it from melting the foam and it works just fine, especially when it's dispersed widely and thinly across sort of this pond-like shape so just keep that in mind when you're pouring resin onto a piece uh, you don't want to pour like this super heavy dense layer in a small area because the exothermic or heat generating reaction might actually burn or melt whatever you have next to it so just be careful be mindful do some tests before you dive in and uh, this resin although it's very very thick and syrupy it is self-leveling meaning it will kind of even itself out and uh, it turned out really really good I have a piece of blue tape in the back there to block the resin from falling off the edge of the diorama and uh, it also cures just fine up against that blue tape edge. I just kind of tilted it around in the pond to make sure it got all the way to the edges of the little sort of shores that I created and would cure nicely and uh, I'm very 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 happy with the results. This is what it looked like after sitting there for a while and starting to self level. And this resin takes about 72 hours to cure. I think it takes about 8 to 10 hours to get to where it's like hard to the touch, but about 72 hours to fully cure. So this has been covered for 72 hours to prevent dust from getting onto the resin as it cures. And uh, it's now nice and hard and cured. It's got a little bit of a rippling on the top of the surface. That's probably because when I poured it on, it was already starting to cure. And then I did the sort of shake back and forth. And so some of the different curing um, molecular structures behaved a little bit differently than they were supposed to because I waited too long to do that. So I ended up actually pouring another very, very thin layer of resin on top of this one, which really made it look like glass. It was absolutely beautiful.